So, we are now into a um, very exciting part of our agenda. We have four um, uh, wonderful gentlemen to speak with you. So I figure I'm compensating here, so I have more time, so I, I'm a couple of women. And then we've got our four gentlemen speaking for you today. Um, and we're starting with um, really a, a dear friend and, and an inspiration, I think, to many in the sustainability movement. Rick Ridgway, who is Vice President for Public uh, Engagement at Patagonia, also a um, incredibly talented mountain climber, um, both physically, but then also, I think, in terms of his career, um, likes to figure out how to climb the sustainability mountains that we're all dealing with, um, including starting and launching the Sustainable Apparel um, Coalition, which has been you know, really important to uh, really making that industry more sustainable. So, Rick, we're really thrilled to have you here. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks, Tonzi. Um, and uh, thank you for the invitation to join you guys here today. <clears throat> and I notice how you were really watching the clock, so I brought my coffee up here. I'm going to stay caffeinated and move quite quickly. <clears throat> I'm here to explain to you this morning uh, about one of Patagonia's most important sustainability initiatives that uh, you may not know about and that many of you often don't include when you think about sustainability, and that is the way that our company, Patagonia, treats its employees. And specifically, I'm here to explain to you <coughs> our programs to support our employees around our extended support to their families, around our company to su uh, support to our employees, families. And this is a super important topic. And it is very, very central to sustainability in, in our eyes. And uh, I'm going to this morning be explaining to you the program, but then I'm really going to take a little deep dive into the ROI, because that's the topic of the day. But before I do that, I want to say that just yesterday, <coughs> without even looking for it, I found three references to this topic in the press. Uh, there was an article in Psychology Today called Mothers Are Drowning in Stress. <clears throat> uh, there was an online magazine called Vox with an article called uh, Mothers at Amazon Are Fighting for Child Care. They're called the Mamazonians. <laughs> and then I saw a review of a book yesterday called <clears throat> Making Motherhood, Motherhood Work, and it had the subtitle, uh, with uh, what the author calls addressing the work-family conflict. And that is the theme of my talk this morning, that from our company's viewpoint, there is no conflict. It doesn't exist. It's total opportunity. And it's a total opportunity for everyone in the room here to think about how anybody can replicate what we're doing. So let's start by, you know, as most of you know, telling you we're in the business of outdoor sports. and. Um, we have many family-friendly policies, and for us, uh, the phrase uh, family business uh, has more than the usual definition, uh, although, in fact, uh, we're still privately held, and we're still owned by the family of our co-founders, uh, Melinda and Yvonne Chenard. Uh, Yvonne's the guy with the flannel shirt. He still comes into the office every day that uh, he isn't fly fishing or surfing, so he's really not in the office that much anymore, but <laughs> back in 1957, he started out as a blacksmith, you know, making pitons, carabiners, and hammers, and hardware for, for climbers. And he opened a blacksmith shop in Ventura, California, just north of LA. And he located it there for a super strategic business reason, because it was only a short walk from a good surf break. But by the early 70s, he had expanded the product line <coughs> to a few items of clothing, uh, one worn by yours truly on an ascent in Yosemite. <coughs> But the clothes were all made with the same dedication to quality and durability as the, as the climbing hardware. And when the clothing part of the business started to take off, Yvonne spun it off as a separate business in the early 70s. And he was looking for a name for the new company. And this was only a few years after he had made a long expedition to Patagonia, pa Patagonia the place down in southern South America, to climb Fitzroy, <coughs> which is the tallest peak on uh, the right. Uh, and uh, that's where the name came from. Uh, that tall peak on your logo of your Patagonia jacket is Fitzroy. So we started as a family business, and we 
are a family business, and as much as any business I've ever encountered, we're a family because when you walk around our campus, it looks like a family, and if you pause and listen for a minute, it totally sounds like a family. children at the workplace creates a kind of richness in the experience of being at work. It lightens the place, it makes people feel closer to their community. This is the kind of world we need to live in, where people's lives are integrated with their work. <laughs> so our child care facilities and the, and the playgrounds are position between uh, the buildings on our campus in a really conscious effort uh, to blur the lines between office space and, and child-friendly uh, places and space so that we end up with a, a, a real neighborhood feel. And when your family life and your work life are all melded together, it becomes the foundation of your company's culture. And maybe the most profound thing of all, the most important thing of all, that is when you have kids around, uh, it begins to shape the way that you treat your fellow workers and it influences the way that you make your decisions and even the way that you, you start to think. And so, how did we get here? Well, I'm gonna rewind just a little bit uh, and go back to the beginning that with full disclosure, our family policies didn't start out uh, all that smoothly and it goes back to the beginning in the early 70, 70s when um, Yvonne's wife, Melinda, started <laughs> bringing her baby into the office and, and some of the employees uh, weren't all that excited about the crying and the dirty diapers and, and finally the retail store manager back then said, listen, it's me or the baby. <clears throat> and he lost his job but the, <laughs> the challenge got worse when our employees began having kids and, and started bringing their kids to work and, and this included my own wife, Jennifer, who founded the company's marketing department and advertising division. And, and when she started bringing uh, our daughter, Carissa, into the office, who you see there, and who, by the way, Tonzi, is a NYU grad, so uh, <laughs> NYU's in our family. Anyway, Carissa, the NYU grad to be, was dubbed the whaler because nobody could have a conversation in a meeting. And my wife struggled to find a private place to breastfeed our daughter, so Melinda had the clever idea to rent this trailer and park it in front of the office and put a rocking chair inside in a crib and then hire a babysitter. And this kind of worked. Uh, but then other employees started dropping their kids off in the trailer and pretty soon it filled up. And fortunately there was another building under construction at the time so Melinda just literally hijacked the floor plan uh, and took a corner of the new building and crossed out what was supposed to be there and wrote childcare. <laughs> and that be, you know, when you're a private company you get to do whatever you want. And that became the company's first on-site child care center. Uh, and it was inaugurated by Yvonne and some of his mountain climbing buddies <coughs> uh, trying out the kids' toilets. But the <laughs> on-site, you know, it, it opened in 1984 and it was really an instant hit. And it became quickly recognized, uh, not only because it was an early example of corporate on-site daycare, but because, <coughs> and more importantly, it wasn't really daycare, it wasn't just on-site babysitting, but in fact it was a leading example of child development and that's why it's called the Great Pacific or Patagonia Child Development Center. Uh, and our founder, uh, Yvonne, um, you know, he still likes all of us. We like to spend time, uh, you know, uh, giving tours and uh, taking people through our, our child development center. Uh, and one day he was doing that and he asked some of the four and five year olds, uh, he says, hey kids, how's school today? And one of them looked at him and said, I'm not in school, I'm at work. <laughs> I said, My mom works there, I work here. <laughs> so, <clears throat> you know, we've explained both the child development philosophy that we have and our other techniques for family support in a book that we released last year by our publishing arm, Patagonia Books, and it was written by uh, Yvonne, or by Melinda and, and my wife, Jennifer, and it's 
It's really 400 pages of photographs and text that explains how our caregivers integrate our employees' work lives with our children's lives and chapters that are devoted to topics like teaching kids to learn through their senses, to inspire creativity, to develop the value of learning to work with your hands at a very early age. And the book supports our view that, you know, it isn't always easy being a, a mother in a world where things don't always go as you hope. And even Sheryl Sandberg's got to realize that it's, it's way more than just leaning in. And it's beyond unfair to ask a new mother to choose between being a mother and having a job. And, and that's why we've strived hard to <clears throat> remove that burden from our employees' lives. And from our new mothers to our new fathers, because it includes fathers too. And, and how much do our employees value this? <clears throat> well, let's let some of them speak for themselves in, in this clip. I mean, it's the peace of mind that allows me to work. My child is not only on campus with me, but he's in the building next door. I, I wouldn't have come back to work had this program not been here. I would have stayed home with Gabe until he was school age. Twist, 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 twist. The life balance component here is amazing. It pushes you to participate daily on their kids' lives. The community is aware that your kids are there. Everyone gets, a, gets the feeling of what it is to have a, a little one in your life. The ability to have your child on campus here is hands down the best perk that the company offers. Let my people go surfing is amazing, but I'll trade a surf session or a lunchtime soccer match for being able to just put my daughter down for a nap. It doesn't compare. Being able to provide for her on a daily basis and really uh, build that relationship really built my confidence as a father. When women's careers are starting to really kick in is often the time when we're thinking about starting a family. And it is a struggle and you're asking yourself all these questions. And at Patagonia, it was a no-brainer. I could do both. Other businesses should be able to look at this and see how it has made the kids flourish, the parents flourish, enabled women and men to fully engage in their career life as well as their family life and not skip a beat on either. So, you know, 40 years now and uh, well over 2,000 kids later, uh, we've learned quite a few things and along the way we've expanded our policies to support, um, you know, not just uh, mothers and kids, but the full families. So in addition to our uh, on-site child development centers and Ventura at our headquarters and at our Reno distribution center, uh, and we'll be building uh, more centers uh, in Europe and, and Japan and Asia as we, as we expand. But we also offer financial support for uh, child care if, uh, if it's needed, and we give 16 weeks of paid maternity leave uh, to mothers, and we give 12 weeks of paid paternity leave to new fathers, <coughs> both birthing and adoptive parents. We have uh, private on-site lactation rooms for mothers um, in Ventura and Reno and uh, our other offices around the world. Our, our teachers will alert a nursing mother uh, if the baby needs them. Uh, and if a nursing mother is unable to get down to the development center, uh, then the teachers bring the baby to her in the meeting. And she's encouraged to breastfeed in the meeting. We think that's the way we should be living our lives. <clears throat> we have adoption assistance and, and support. <clears throat> uh, this really blows people away sometimes. We have a travel support program that funds the cost of a family member or a caregiver to accompany a new mother when she's on a business trip. We'll rent a hotel room right next to the mother's hotel room and put the child support person right next there. And we provide up to 12 weeks when an employee or his or her spouse or domestic partner or, or child or, or parent, when any uh, member of the family experiences a, a serious medical condition. <clears throat> now, 
you know, just reading about policy like this in an HR manual or maybe having me standing up here talking about it using phrases like serious medical condition, <clears throat> it, it, it misses what this is really about. And I think it's impossible for an, even a, a photograph or an image to speak about the importance of this part of our policy. So again, I want to let some of our employees who have been there tell you what it's like when you are there. I am the Vice President of Environmental Activism. And I'm the Director of Global Merchandising. I am the Category Finance Director. VP of Supply Chain. And I'm the CEO of Patagonia. So I used paid family leave a couple times in my life. The first two were really fun because I had uh, two daughters. With both of those kids, I, I took paid paternity leave. It's a huge transition in life when you have a child. I was able to fully embrace being a new mom and balance my work family priorities. I think a lot of dads who have to go right back to work right away, they just miss out on those, those kind of precious first moments in life. So there was another time period in my life when I needed to drop everything and exclusively focus on a family situation. We had, you know, doctors we had to meet with and surgery that he had to have right away, doctor's appointments and second opinions. I mean, just the emotional toll of that, I mean, that's hard enough. And if you were to add another layer of stress on that, of knowing that your job was at risk, your income was at risk, your health care. I really don't know how people do this without those kind of benefits. Because you don't plan to, you know, find out that someone in your family has a terminal illness or that you do. I didn't have to choose between being with my son and having my job. And when you're faced with your mortality, that's really what you want to do, is you want to embrace life, embrace every moment, and, and give thanks for it. And I was able to really do that with him, um, even to the very end of his life. The U.S. is behind most developed countries. I mean, that's a fact when it comes to valuing caregiving. It's unrealistic to think that we are just a worker or just a caregiver, just a mom. All of our employees are people. They're all human beings with kids and families, and we need to create a supportive environment for people to, to be their best and to do their best. I feel like I'm viewed as more than just tool for the company to make more money. I feel proud to work for a place where I can bring my whole self to work. I'm very loyal to the company. There's no line between my personal life and my professional life. It's all blended together. And you get one shot to walk the earth and thank goodness that mine is all blended together with such joy. This one's hard on me, <clears throat> but um, you know, we lost Michelle uh, a little over a year ago now, and her husband, Mark, he um, still works for us, and you know, he knows that, <clears throat> that we've got his back. He totally knows that. And as uh, surfers, we, we follow the Hawaiian tradition of having paddle outs, and we join hands in a large circle, and, and that's what we did to scatter Michelle's ashes and return her to the place that nurtured her soul and is going to continue to nurture her husband and her children and, and nurture all of us who had the, the privilege of, of working with her. So you heard from our employees, you heard them explain the, the human side of this and, and now we're going to switch to the other side of our brains uh, to the business side of these family policies. Uh, I'm going to talk about paid maternity leave uh, to paid paternity leave to paid adoptive parent leave to paid extended sick leave to adoption assistance and subsidized on-site child care, employee travel child support, child care tuition support, <coughs> uh, and we'll take a look at how uh, we're go and we're going to look at the business side of all these family policies <coughs> and Tonzi, we're going to stay on schedule. <coughs> We're going to go through uh, uh, the business value that derives from these policies. So I'm going to be taking a look at the tax benefits, the increased employee retention, the 
enhanced employee recruitment we enjoy, the increased employee engagement. I'm going to explain why at Patagonia we have more women in management and why we enjoy incredible employee loyalty. <clears throat> and with that incredible employee morale. I mean, it is unbelievable there. Uh, but before I do, um, we're going to have our vice president of HR, uh, Dean Carter, uh, put it in uh, context uh, in uh, this next video clip. We would do video this clip. even if it affected our bottom line negatively. It's still the right thing. But I realize we're a private company. I realize there are companies who are public and have to answer to shareholders. And when, you, when you're answering to shareholders and you put you know, true pen to paper, you can show how this is a financial benefit. You just have to do some work. When we do the math at Patagonia, it comes up to a better bottom line, lower turnover, and more productive and more engaged employees. That's the math for us. I'd encourage any company looking at it, do your own math, and I'd be highly surprised if you didn't come out with the answer that you need to be a lot more forward in your family policies. <clears throat> so let's go into the numbers for just a few minutes. We're going to start with child care. <clears throat> uh, first, the majority of the cost uh, of that on-site development center, child development center, is covered by the employees, and, and they pay about $14,500 a year uh, for the children in the center five days a week. Um, unless they're lower income, and then we do provide subsidies, as I mentioned earlier. And, and after all that's factored in, uh, the company ends up uh, putting in, you know, just for our Ventura facility, about an additional uh, million dollars. And then we recover 91% of that million through benefits that are totally quantifiable with totally justified dollar valuations. And this starts with tax benefits uh, that include a federal uh, tax credit for qualified child care development, and that's not a tax deduction, that's a tax credit, uh, and up to uh, $150,000 a year for that um, benefit. And the second is a deduction from corporate sales tax of up to 35% of the costs that exceed revenues uh, for the entire program, but that's just the direct cost recovery. Uh, and other sources of business value that, uh, again, are very quantifiable <clears throat> include the approximately 30% uh, that we get back because of increased employee retention. And this is a number that's pr actually pretty easy to quantify because when you lose an employee, the lost productivity uh, while the position's open plus the time <clears throat> it takes for recruitment plus the, the cost of relocation and, and training, all of that adds up to about... 30, between 35 and 150 percent of an employee's salary, depending on, on their position and the law, uh, level of their compensation. And here's another basic statistic to consider that in the U.S., 20 to 35 percent of working mothers who give birth never return to their previous job. That was the centerpiece of that article I saw yesterday in that Vox magazine. And <clears throat> here's a story about retention that has a, a little bit different ending. Uh, we've been tracking this for quite a while in our company for many years now, and we have, looking over the last eight or nine years, over 97% of our mothers coming back to work, and in the last three or four years, it goes up to 100%. We haven't lost anybody, any mother who's returned to work after her maternity leave, and we can all agree that that's pretty good employee retention, and you can see retention in action on our campus, um, <coughs> where many of our kids uh, that were raised in our child development center now work at the company, uh, including this mother and her son. And remember my, you know, uh, my NYU grad, Carissa, the, 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 the whaler uh, at our first Patagonia daycare um, uh, member in the trailer there? Well, this is her um, working uh, now with her daughter, who's my granddaughter, who's now in our child development center. And, and I think we can all agree that's that's really employee retention. <laughs> uh, and employee recruitment, maybe. We'll see what Coda, little Coda does with her life. But seriously, in, in addition to retention, another benefit <clears throat> is the higher rates of uh, employee recruitment that we enjoy. And after we posted the video that I showed you a few minutes ago where our employees told you how important it was during a family crisis uh, for the company to have their backs, well, after that video uh, went online, the pool of applicants uh, coming into HR took an immediate jump of 30 percent. 
I mean, imagine, that was directly linked to putting that video online. And when you look at our applicant pool, uh, you don't need to segment it. It's easy for us, for example, to get younger single people who, um, you know, move to the beach in Southern California. All, all you got to do is say surfing and they, and they pack their bags. But, but getting somebody at the apex of their career, um, who's often potentially the most valuable employee you could recruit, to ask them to uproot and move their families, that, that's a lot. But our recruiters tell us that as soon as they say integrated child development, and care to the candidates, the conversation changes really fast. And take the example of uh, one of my colleagues, Phil Graves. Uh, and Phil runs our internal impact investing fund. All of you guys in the investment world, um, we're in your uh, world as well with our own uh, impact fund. And Phil's a super experienced Wall Street guy. I mean, he's from New York here. He's like venture capital expert. And you know, he could have easily followed the money. But, and I'm not dissing anybody here, <laughs> but <laughs> instead he chose like a different path. And let's let him explain it to you uh, himself. My prior career, uh, I was a dad and I didn't really get to see my kids much at all, Monday through Friday. Uh, best case, I'd come home and finish the bath and read him a quick story and put him to bed so we'd have like 20 or 30 minutes together. And uh, for me, if I could come to a place where I could still use my background and, and technical skills, but have more quality time during the week with the kids, that to me was, was really compelling, more than just a financial decision about uh, you know, going to a place and making a certain salary. <laughs> uh, for all of you in Phil's business here, I brought job applications with me today in my <laughs> bag here. <laughs> so business value also comes from increased employee uh, engagement, and uh, studies show that when a parent has a high quality uh, on-site child care support uh, at work that they're, they're less stressed and they're more focused. And you know, here's something I didn't put in the presentation that uh, Dean just told me two weeks ago that at our company, amongst all of our cohorts, we have the lowest healthcare costs to our healthcare provider of any company they represent anywhere close to our cohort. And we think it's because we don't have stressed out employees and they're just healthier. Now, I don't know how you put monetize that, but I'm sure you can. And they're just more, yeah, you're the monetization expert, Tanzi, get on it. So they're totally productive. And another outcome that provides business value is the increased percentage of women in, in management. And at Patagonia, women make up 50% of our workforce. Uh, and that's uh, half of our upper management positions, it's half of our board of directors, um, and uh, study, you know, you guys know this, that when you have a healthy gender mix at the leadership level, um, it really improves performance and it makes the business just smarter and, and more creative. And we also have income parity across the entire company, except at the C-suite level, because the women are making a lot more money than the men right now at Patagonia, but we're working to catch up. And the final intangible benefit is the claim that, you know, that this is the one I made at the beginning, that when you got kids around us, you, you're, you're just nicer to each other. And we haven't done any studies on this, and, uh, and I admit it's kind of anecdotal and intuitive, and, and you can't probably quantify it, but when you're in a meeting and out the window you hear kids in the background laughing and playing in the yard, <coughs> You can't be an asshole. It just, it just doesn't work. And you just got to be nice to everybody when you hear this. Well, the company wouldn't enjoy any of this if it wasn't for our wonderful teachers, and, and they're all trained, uh, they're really skilled, they're among the most dedicated people in the company, and we make sure we support them by paying rates and salaries that are uh, competitive and even above competitive for well-qualified teachers, and we give them the full benefits that our employees enjoy, and, and we can never do any of this if, like a lot of companies, we outsourced childcare, and that's why you know, for the last uh, 
years, we've had less than 15% turnover in our teaching staff. So now we've seen the specific business values derived from this child and family support, but let's look at another uh, less specific but still super important benefit that we enjoy that comes not only from childcare but from, as I said, all the family support policies, and that's the, the loyalty that we all have for each other in the company. And it's a loyalty that is there because the company is providing a workspace that supports individuals and their families, if, if you, as you've heard our employees uh, tell you. And, and in turn, it's created a trust that's foundational to our success and our, and our culture. Uh, and, the, and the final part that we ask all you guys to consider right now is that it's not business value per se, because it's really a higher value than that. It's a value that is more important than, than any business value you get out of this. Uh, it's more important than any value to the organization. And, and in fact, it's the fact that the, the kids uh, are growing up through our program uh, in a way that's gonna make them become better citizens, better contributors to their society. They're just gonna be better human beings. Uh, and it's going to create a true a pool uh, of better future employees. <laughs> but as I said, they're going to be better people. Now, despite all these advantages, you know, currently our business leaders in the U.S., as you've heard Rose allude to, they provide family leave to, what, 13% of our country's workers. Uh, last time I checked the statistic, about a year ago, and that's only a fraction of them pr that provide on-site child development for employees. So, so we feel that one of the reasons the, numbers, the number isn't higher is because business leaders just don't understand this business value. And, you know, it's probably like even how they don't understand the business value in the, in the auto sector of uh, end-of-life responsibility. It's like you got to start making them aware of this and just lay out the numbers like I'm doing for you right now because they probably don't appreciate how easy it is to even make the first step, uh, to simply start by opening a lactation room for nursing mothers. And, and what we did, that was our first step, the trailer, a place for my wife and my daughter to be together at the company. That was like easy, it didn't cost hardly anything. So we're hopeful that other companies uh, will make their first steps, will um, you know, take their first step down this path. As Tanzi said, it's, it's all a journey. Uh, and a funny thing happened after we released the, some of the video clips that you've seen in this presentation. It's that you know, people did start asking us for help so they could make the case for childcare at their businesses and, uh, and they could make the case for other comprehensive family support policies. So you know, we've listened and we developed the presentation that I just showed you. And we're here to help anybody interested in this, in guiding uh, your companies or your organizations, whether, and if your students, the ones that you're gonna go work for into, you know, at this point, what is leadership positions on family support policy. Uh, and we hope uh, that you tell all your colleagues that, um, you know, at, at Patagonia, uh, you know, when people ask us, you know, well, what's the best thing you guys make? What's your favorite product? And this is not a throwaway line. This is from our hearts. This is something that, that we truly 100% mean when we tell them that at Patagonia, kids are our best product. So from all of us at Patagonia, thank you so much. <laughs> so the, the question was, we have gender uh, equity uh, in our uh, employee pool from the bottom to the top. Do we have uh, other... Uh, you know, racial, uh, for example, uh, parity and, and, and a representation, and, and we don't. Uh, and we're really working on it. And every year we're getting closer. And it's a, it's, a, it's a huge challenge. And for us specifically, it's a challenge because we're in the business of, the, of outdoor sports. And it's really hard for us to recruit enough people with enough uh, other t uh, diversity measurements into our employee pool, you know, to get us to the goals that, that we have in the sector that we're at. So then we think, well, this is a larger social problem that we've got. Like, how do we get a wider group of um, 
the Ameri uh, you know, of the uh, American public into the outdoors so that they learn and get inspired by nature. And so then we start funding NGOs that are in the business of going out into, uh, into African American communities, into uh, um, Latino communities, we support two groups there, uh, who are in the business of getting young uh, people uh, out of the cities and into the outdoors. And then we work with them, uh, you know, try to provide them uh, materials they need to also teach those kids that, <coughs> that in nature comes some of life's best lessons, some of the most important things you can learn, to really get them inspired to internalize it, to, to make it part of their lives as they become adults. And then, and then those are the kind of people that we can bring into our company and we can benefit each other mutually. So it's a, it's a, it's a long-term long, uh, term effort and, and, and we're in it deeply and every year we're getting a lot better and we track it very closely. Well, the question was, you know, how do we engage in skill development? How do we support our companies, uh, our, our employees' own personal growth so they have the skills that, as a business, we need? Uh, and, um, you know, it starts with recruitment. So, again, that's, um, you know, we get to pick the best and, and brightest. We get to pick the people that have uh, not just the skill sets that we need at the beginning of their careers with us, um, but probably more importantly, the, the personal values that are aligned with our company culture uh, they have to have that uh, if they're going to get hired. And, you know, we, when we have a job opening, we get somewhere usually between 500 and 4,000 applications. Uh, and despite the scandals in the newspapers now, uh, it's way harder to get into Patagonia than it is into Harvard. Or <laughs> 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 you know, we had, we had 13 internships last summer, which is terrible. We've got to increase that number. We know it. We're working on it. We had 10,000 applications. Um, but then once they're there, and especially when they're young, you've got to bring them along because you know they're going to be there until they're like me, you know, old gray beards. <laughs> because a lot of employees are there for 30 and 40 plus years. So that's the HR department has, like, you know, probably most uh, sophisticated companies, really robust training programs. And we really do support our, our, our employees' education and, and skill development. Uh, through the, those programs, and I'd be here all morning going through them, but just know that they're myriad, uh, they're extensive, uh, and they really, really work. And, and they're, they include things that are perhaps uncommon in most businesses, like, you know, uh, paying an employee to go work at an NGO for two months or three months of paid leave. If that NGO is doing work that we believe will advance that employee's skills and values, personal values and commitments uh, around these shared values that the company's committed to. Thank okay, you so you're welcome. Um, so next up we have um, James Stevens, who is um, Director of Global Government and External Affairs at Aston Martin. Um, I should disclose that I am lucky enough to be on the board of Aston Martin. Um, have not yet gotten to drive one of the cars, but I will. Uh, well, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We're having a slight technical difficulty with the slides at the moment, but uh, I will start using my paper notes to follow Rick's uh, presentation. Uh, Aston Martin's quite an exciting company, but uh, that was a, a, very, a very inspiring presentation. I have a loud voice anyway, so hopefully that, 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 that was coming across. Um, and we are doing an awful lot of work around trying to address our gender diversity uh, at Aston Martin. Uh, automotive is not a particularly female-friendly in, in industry, uh, historically. Uh, we are some way off where Patagonia are, so uh, really, really inspiring uh, presentation. Thank you. So whilst... Uh, <laughs> should be the easy part. So, Aston Martin, uh, uh, we have a, sh a short video for you in a minute which shows you a little bit about who we are. Um, appearing any second now. <laughs> IT, wonderful. I will spin on because I know I'm con conscious of time here. Yeah, I'm sorry, with the fork in the middle, though, of course it'll need it to work. With what? Oh, there we go, there we go, there we go. There we go. Right, okay, thank you, thank you. This one on, this one for the next slide, fantastic. Right, okay, so Aston Martin... Move this around. Aston Martin Lagonda. Um, brief introduction as to who we are. Here we go.
go. It's a very exciting time for us. We're investing in lots of different products and technologies that you would have seen in that, in, in that film. Uh, it, we're in a paradigm shift as an industry. Um, consumer choice is changing rapidly. Um, we have to diversify and we have to look at what those customers want. Tonsi mentioned electrification. That is an integral part of our future strategy uh, underneath our current management team. We're delighted that someone of, of Tonsi's background can be a member of our, our board and scrutinize us going forward, which is fantastic. So Aston Martin Gonda is the world's only independent luxury car group. Uh, it's important to underscore the independence here. We we aren't part of, part of a wider automotive group like many of our, our competitors. Um, we're, we're, we're two brands. We're Aston Martin, very well known, 106 years old, the car of choice for a certain British spy. Uh, uh, <laughs> the other is far less well known, uh, yet much older. La Gonda is actually 119 years old, uh, founded in 1899. Uh, and we refer to La Gonda as our 119-year-old startup. Uh, why a startup? Because we've re rebirth this uh, this brand as a super luxury electric brand. This would sit at, uh, on, on top of Tesla alongside Rolls-Royce and Bentley, but entirely electric. Um, over the course of our history, we've uh, We've made uh, just a few cars, 85,000 in, in total. Uh, that's pretty much what Toyota Group do uh, in three days. Just to put it in context, 106 years, 85,000 cars total. Of that 85,000 cars, 98% of them are still on the road. I, mean, I, I say on the road, they're in garages, they're in bags. Uh, <laughs> when, when cars cost $22.5 million, uh, as, as the DBR1 pictured at the bottom right, uh, you, you tend to look after them a little bit. Uh, so in terms of, we like to think we're a quite a sustainable uh, company from a recycling point of view. Uh, <laughs> and it was very challenging, I think, for, for Tonsi and Elise and team here to... Uh, look at our business alongside the VW and the GM uh, uh, business models because we are very, very different, which I'll come on to uh, later on. So our vehicles are handcrafted. We make these cars by hand. Um, I often use a phrase, you know, 200 plus hours for, for our, our vehicles. Um, a Nissan uh, against an Aston Martin, a huge price difference, but the number of hours, it's 10 times the number. So actually our cars are a bargain. Uh, when, it, when it comes to that. Uh, we have one robot in our factory, um, just, just one. Uh, it does a, a, a particularly dirty, messy job that people could do, but actually it's easier if a robot does it. But we celebrate that handcrafted nature. So looking at sustainability, so we started looking at this seriously. I, I, we, you know, the company has looked at this on an ad hoc basis for many, many years. It's just never really been integrated into, into who we are and what we do. Uh, and we started looking at sustainability strategy development uh, a couple of years ago. In, in, so in 2017, we started looking at the, the UN SDGs. Uh, we thought they were the ones that were probably of most priority to us. They are all important, uh, don't get me wrong, but uh, you've got to start somewhere. And we think those are the ones that we can have the most impact on uh, initially. So we, we look to build our, our, our strategy, balancing risk versus reward, and to develop a real world sustainable impact. So that's how we've come to look at our strategy. Implementing that strategy in 2018, this is 2019's view, we slightly tweaked it this year, um, but looking at 2018, we, we integrated this strategy um, to deliver stakeholder value through the ethical and sustainable excellence, creating long-term competitive advantage. We're not stupid. Much of this stuff actually derives pounds, shillings, and pence, or cents and dollars for you Americans, uh, uh, into, into our business, to so the bottom line. Some of this is very, very, you know, a, a bit of a no-brainer. Um, so we looked at four different pillars uh, for our strategy. Environmental sustainability, community and stakeholder engagement, picking up the our employees matter, the community, communities in which we operate matter to us. If they don't matter, we're going to have a problem. Um, health and well-being, again, you know, if we have sick staff, they're unproductive staff. They leave. They don't, we don't have that retention. Uh, and ensuring that we have an inclusive workforce, really important stuff for us. And sustainable supply chain. Our CEO is really, really impassioned by ensuring that we have zero slavery throughout our, 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 our supply chain. That's really, really hard, really, really hard to try and uh, identify. But we do a lot of work with our supply chain to ensure that we make sure that uh, uh, we are ethical in, in, in that sense. 
Um, all of these, uh, these pillars have a number of objectives. Some of them are listed at the bottom of the slide for you. Um, and our strategy for this is, this is integrated into our corporate strategy. So our executive team, Tonsi sits on the board, the board scrutinized the executive management of the company. All of this is integrated. We t Tonsi touched on earlier on about sustainable resources. Well, um, we're a small company, but we do have a small dedicated team centrally looking at sustainability. Um, and then we have an integrated um, uh, cross-functional working group, a, a working group that I chair, uh, that reports through to our CFO. So our CFO is acutely aware and acutely interested in how we can monetize, identify, monetize, and uh, look at opportunities for savings uh, and benefit for the business. That's the government. So you saw earlier on a little bit of work we're doing with Stern. We're looking at a, a number of opportunities. So we embarked on this act activity about 18 months, two years ago with Tonsi, Elise and Kevin, uh, looking for opportunities of value creation through efficiency savings and sustainable investment. Uh, the project's almost complete, um, but we're looking at uh, all areas of the business, uh, identifying, determining, uh, quantifying and monetizing these opportunities. There's a few of the, the, the numbers on there that we've got to so far. Um, waste. Uh, uh, emissions uh, uh, resource consumption and employee retention are key areas that we think we can have real tangible benefit in but again we're looking at short-term efficiency savings what are the low-hanging fruit what can we do quickly easily cheaply that we can have a, an immediate impact and then what are the longer-term investments that we need senior buy-in in how you know, we want to make an investment over here it's going to cost the company money the return on investment will will be longer the payback period longer etc so we've identified uh, this in a couple of different areas so this analysis and monetization is critical at gaining broader support within the business uh, you from the investment world will, will, will appreciate this we've got to get the buy-in and the reward must outweigh the risk um, I've got a few case studies that I'll take you through now, examples that we've been, work, we've been working on uh, over the course of the past 12 months, uh, some of which are fairly simple, fairly, fairly, fairly straightforward, others not so much. So energy efficiency savings, again I talk about low hanging fruit, so opportunities that we've identified, um, variable speed drive units in our air, air handling units. Um, We've got some very bright people, very smart people looking at what we're doing. Um, in the past, this has been far, far lower down in the, in the, at the working level and hasn't had the priority given to it. Through our integrated project team, these opportunities are being brought through to management's attention. So this was integrated last year, capital cost of £30,500, savings of £37,000 a year. It's a bit of a no-brainer when it comes to an econ economics payback of, of 0.8 of a year. And again, saving CO2 of 175 uh, tonnes. And these are small, small numbers, but these small activities do add up. Op opportunity two, energy. Uh, we have big spaces in our manufacturing facilities. Um, they are uh, normally lit with very energy-intensive uh, lighting. We switched those lights out last year. Uh, for LEDs, um, uh, they were, I think, 400 watt bulbs. These are very, very hungry resource, uh, hungry uh, uh, bulbs. We switched those out last year. Capital cost of 19,500 pounds. Annual savings, 33,000 pounds. So, yeah, there's, there's a theme here that I'm, I, hopefully you're picking up. And we're saving 505,000 kilowatt hours of energy annually. Starting to get a bit more complicated now, so we're actually looking into the actual manufacturing process, um, picking into particular uh, technology within the it, within the factory. This w this here, we're looking at our paint shop process for climate control. Um, for those of you who don't know, you've got to cool and heat cars when you when you've painted them. You've got to heat them up, bake the paint on, and then cool it down. Actually, looking at the technology that regulates that temperature fluctuation uh, is important. So we looked at uh, looked at this. Just by tweaking the software fairly inexpensively, we were able to make uh, significant savings in both the gas consumption, 14%, uh, within this, this particular area of, of the facility, uh, and electrical savings of 58%, just by small tweaks, relatively inexpensive tweaks. Um, there are the total gas savings. So obviously, the, the number above does not correspond with the number below. Uh, the total paint shop energy use is obviously slightly different to the air replacement plant usage there. But again, you're seeing a downward trend. We made a lot more cars last year than we did the year before. So our production has gone up, yet our energy consumption has gone down. This is just good, good business sense. 
Looking longer term, uh, this is our second facility, which will go live at the end of this year. This is where we're going to make our new SUV. This is in a, on, a, on a former military uh, airfield in the south of Wales. Wales is a uh, part of the United Kingdom. Um, uh, our other facilities in England, another part of the United Kingdom. So looking at a... a, a uh, p pardon the Welsh people in the room. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, we're all English, really. Uh, um <laughs> Get me into trouble. Uh, so, so when we've got a new facility that's not up and running, uh, it's quite easy to look at how we generate electricity on site. One of the one of the key challenges for us is if we have to down, um, if we have to uh, stop production, that costs us money. So the CFO doesn't like that, the CEO doesn't like that, and the board wouldn't like that. So actually, looking at a blank canvas, which we have at the moment, this facility goes live December of this year. So we've got a year nine months now, effectively, to identify opportunities to generate our own electricity on site, ensure that we can store energy on site, and look at, look at how we can swap out lighting uh, and, and make sure that we are, we're as efficient as possible. So uh, we're doing a study with a company at the moment where hopefully that's going to come forward with zero capital outlay, but also a reduction in the per kilowatt hour cost of the, of, of, of the electricity. Um, it would involve spit onto the next slide, solar going onto the roof, so we'd have a rooftop solar array generating around about two megawatt hours, we'd have a battery backup system storing that energy when we're not using it. Um, this, we, we, we can't be completely reliant on the solar system, so we're looking at other opportunities like combined heat and power, uh, burning biogas, so again, all coming back to our sustainability. Um, in the UK, we have a, um, uh, quite a lot of the question earlier on about taxation uh, on, on some of this stuff. We, there are lots of taxes on energy. They're going up every year. So actually having this investment and actually selling it to the management team, that if we put a little bit of investment over here, actually we have a saving year on year. The carbon reduction commitment cost, the tax cost to the business based on our volumes last year, £350,000 a year. This is the tax cost off the top. Um, as we turn on a second factory, and that gets up to volume, you can almost double that, and that tax base is going up every year. So it makes good sense to utilise the space we've got, and if you can get it for, well, I wouldn't say for free, but certainly with no capital outlay, uh, it makes the decision in terms of the return on investment very, very easy. Um, last but certainly not least, uh, I, I, I'm being flashed that I'm, I'm well over my time already. Uh, Lagonda, uh, Tonsi touch, touched upon uh, EVs, uh, um, consumer choice, listening to what consumers want in the world. Uh, it's, an, it's pretty self-explanatory. It's marketing 101. Listen to thy customer. Our customers are saying, it hmm, would be interesting to have an electric Aston Martin. Rolls-Royce, uh, Rolls-Royce's CEO ha was publicly stated saying, we'll make a, an electric Rolls-Royce when the deposit checks cross my desk. Uh, we think there's a market opportunity for us here to rebrand Lagonda as a super luxury EV brand alongside Rolls-Royce, much more progressive, sitting on top of Tesla. Tesla is a premium brand, we're a luxury brand. So the price difference is quite significant. But if you're, if you're a Californian tech entrepreneur and you want an EV, Tesla's about all you can go for at the moment. There isn't anything to go beyond that point. So, and our CEO, the, the quote at the bottom, he's uh, quoted uh, and committed to ensuring that we've got 100% of our uh, electrification across our fleet by the middle of next decade. That doesn't mean that all of our cars sold will be electric, but there will be an offering, hybridised and fully electric, in every Aston Martin and Lagonda by the middle of next decade. There we go. Just a couple of minutes over. Yeah, I think the question was uh, the, the, the time frame in terms of our, our payback period um, and, and how, how we were able to make that money back so quickly. I think possibly starting from a very low base was, was, was one particular aspect. Uh, 400 watt bulbs is pretty analog technology uh, and maybe we should have changed them out some time ago, but it comes back to having uh, an integrated way of looking at sustainability, so something that Tonsi touched on earlier on, um, that we haven't had uh, until the last couple of years. So having that integrated team means that an, a bright idea, um, Japanese management techniques, uh, you know, Kaizen, you know, ha having an opportunity and I identified at someone at the working level, never really got anywhere before. Now that we have this sort of streamlined focus up to myself, then up to our CFO, and then through to the board, uh, means that those ideas can 
get buy-in very, very quickly and very, very easily. So I think probably the answer to your question is we weren't very good to start with, and actually, if I'm honest, uh, and that we're improving on that basis. But actually now looking at uh, minuscule operations, £10,000 saving there, £50,000 saving there, it all adds up. Well, I am um, looking forward to uh, our next speaker, who is Andrew Winston, who I've known for years, and he also is someone who's been an advocate, a uh, writer. Um, you should read his book, The Big Pivot, and his other books, but uh, if you haven't uh, read it, it's, uh, it's a terrific book, terrific read. Um, and he's been uh, really working to evangelize sustainability with business for, for many years. So, Andrew, really terrific to have you here to talk about a specific example that you've been working on. Thank you so much. Um, am I on? Hello? So, can you hear me? All right. So, I, uh, I normally almost always have slides, so I decided to go a little crazy this time and, and not do that. So, I, I may have some jitters at some point without the backup. So, I want to thank you, Tanzi, for having me. Um, I'm excited to be here. I, uh, both my sisters got their MBAs here. My sister just texted me to say, you know I went to NYU, right? I'm like, yeah. Um, seriously, I just got that text. I'm like, yeah, got it. Um, I, they're my older sisters, so they tell me whatever. I'm supposed to do. I unfortunately got my um, I unfortunately got my MBA about 115 blocks north of here. Any? Yes. Hey. Any? Uh, any other Columbia MBAs in the room? Yeah. All right. Anyways, um, so if you've seen me before uh, or know anything about me, I tend to talk really big picture mega trends. I'm not really doing that today. It's kind of a, a much more narrow kind of specific story. But I just want to start with. Just a couple quick thoughts about why I'm excited about this topic, ROI, and the problems with it in business are, is kind of one of my wonky little favorite topics, and it's exciting to have a room that's captive that will have to listen to it. Um, I think fundamentally ROI is broken, not, not, the, not the poor little calculation or tool itself, but the way we use it in business, and, and I think that's a lot of the theme we're hearing today, and you heard it basically in very succinct fashion from Tanzi earlier, that there's just a lot of stuff we don't measure, and that's the fundamental problem that you know, we're very good at measuring I, how much cash we put into something, and then we're good at measuring what we think will be the return in cash, but we're really pretty bad at measuring what's the return in all the other things that matter. And in a world where, you know, 80% of the S&P 500 market cap is intangible, it's a pretty big gap to not be able to measure return of other things like employee loyalty, um, you know, customer loyalty, resilience, the ability to kind of move in and out of the reality we have today, which is very uh, volatile situations, and to have a business that's more resilient. Um, so the story I want to share with you, with, with you today is Tanzi asked me to talk about is because I just wrote an article about it. I, I uh, sit on some sustainability advisory boards. Rick and I shared a, a board uh, with Unilever for years. But I work with Caesars Entertainment. And um, they shared this story with me. And I actually did not work with them on this. I just know them very well. So if you don't know Caesars, they're about $5 billion in sales. They've got 55 million square feet of air-conditioned space. That is, if you've been to a casino, it's probably way too cold. Um, 63,000 employees, 115 million visitors. And they've been going in and they've been in and out of bankruptcy. They came out of bankruptcy in the last few years. But even during that period, they were doing a ton on sustainability. Their absolute emissions were down 23% this decade. The water's down 11%. And a ton of stuff on the social side. They do a lot around um, women in leadership and, and getting to parity, and a lot on human rights and trafficking, which is a huge issue in the hospitality arena. So this is a company that's incredibly focused on data metrics and profits because of their, their bankruptcy situation. Um, and they've done a lot of measurement on the employee engagement side and done that for years and been one of the leaders, I think, in that. But what they, what they did that was, I thought, kind of unique, and I, I wrote this piece in um, Sloan Management Review from another business school, I'm sorry, uh, was they did something interesting to measure uh, the impact of their sustainability efforts on revenues. And, and I've, I haven't really seen this done quite this way before. So they took some of their total rewards, their kind of regular, regular gamblers and, and users of their property in one big property in California, and they, they did a control group. And they did a group where they just sent them information about all their sustainability efforts. We built this five-acre you know, solar, or this five-acre you know, solar field. We did EV charging stations for our employees. We have an on-site garden. They just kind of told them all about it. And then they just kind of waited and measured and saw if these people showed up more. And, and the bottom line was over the next six, month, next six months, in a kind of conservative measurement, the revenue for the test group went up 1.5%. Uh, and the other measure was net promoter score. If you know that in marketing, it means are you, are you willing or excited to recommend a brand to someone? And they saw a 7% increase in the number of people that checked 9 or 10 on the I would really recommend this, this brand or company. 
So before I give you kind of my thoughts or my minor conclusions about that, I'm curious, how many of you think from just that basic story I just told you, they tell some customers about their sustainability efforts, they see a 1.5% increase in revenue. How many of you just honestly raise your hand think that 1.5% sounds important or useful? About half. Um, I was torn about it. I wrote this article and was like, is this, does this matter? Um, and you know, they say it's a huge deal in the, in the company um, because a lot of efforts, they do a lot of marketing efforts, um, re have no return, right? They send people stuff and nothing happens. Um, but that was fast. I've only got five more minutes left? Okay. Um, I, I, I knew that. I'm just kidding. But boy, that you were tough. That was like five. Okay. Um, so here's, here's why I think it's actually kind of interesting and worth thinking about. And I've gotten emails since I published this from people in different sectors going, hey, we want to we kind of measure this too. Um, the main reason is, the, first of all, the net promoter score increase from studies on this is that's a pretty decent increase and that ties by a number of studies to kind of significant brand and, and revenue increases over time. But the other thing to think about is the category. We all know that there's been massive growth in things like organics. There's different ways of thinking about um, the kinds of brands where people will pay more, will think about sustainability. Um, one model is the kind of in me, on me, around me model, right? Things I eat and put in me, I really care about, so you see a growth there. And you saw that in the sectors that Tansi showed earlier. And the on me is, uh, you know, personal care products, and um, around me is maybe stuff you're putting in your home, and I think apparel's kind of right, right past that. And so there's, you know, Patagonia's unusual in a way, and people willing to spend more and spend consistently. Um, but this is hospitality, and I've worked with hospitality in a number of different sectors, and let me just say that what I've heard consistently for years is that when we are in hotels, to put it uh, nicely, we're slobs. And we don't actually care very much about the cards that say, hang up your towels. Like, there's this persona we put on of, like, this is where I throw my towels on the ground, damn it, because I'm away from home and I don't want to do this. So there's, there's, there's been actually in this sector, uh, I think, a pretty light history of caring about any of this. So I'm, I was a little surprised to see this increase in, frankly, gambling, which you think, does that matter at all? These are people who go to gamble because they like to gamble. But clearly, they, they just turned up more. It gave them the good feels about, about the brand. So I, I think there's potential in this kind of study. I just think I'd like to see more companies do this kind of analysis. Say, if we talk about all the things we're doing, because now we're at a stage where in the last five years or so, most big companies have something to brag about. There's been so much buying of renewable energy, or there's been these huge cuts, like the Aston Martin story, showing their, their reductions, showing the things they're doing, not just in a product sale, but just here's what we're about, you know, like Patagonia does so effectively. And I'd like to see companies see if they can prove this return on investment, because top line growth, even a couple percent, is what CEOs and CFOs get really excited about. That's what really gets them on board. It's, the, the energy efficiency stuff, it's just never been sexy to people, even though it's incredibly easy money. Um, and so that's that story. Since I did manage to leave myself three minutes, I wanted to share. So that's a really good positive story about ROI. But I wanted to give another client story, and this is one I was more involved in, that I think shows us some of the challenges we still have and why ROI can be broken. So I have one client that um, is building this just huge building, and the rooftop is going to be multiple um, kind of football fields worth of space. And they said, oh, maybe we should put solar on it. Great. So they do an RFP. And they get back, yes, different companies say, we can put up a bunch of solar. It turns out they, they have very low energy prices. They buy wholesale during the day. It doesn't really matter. But the RFP came in, and these days solar is pretty cheap. But it was still like slightly more expensive than their kind of average expense. And I'm talking slightly, like tens of thousands of dollars for a multi-billion dollar company. So because it was slightly more expensive, what I heard from some of the key operational execs, the guys running this building, they were probably not going to put up the solar. And this is like recent, right? This is recent like after the IPCC 1.5 degree report, which says we may all die, to put it quickly. Um, so maybe it would be a good idea if something's the same cost to do solar. So I kind of got really um, annoyed and, and angry with my client. I was like, what are you guys doing? Like, let's just talk about the different benefits of doing this. There's some structural things you should think about, like when you put solar on a roof, you've, defra you've defrayed heat and you possibly have saved way more than those tens of thousands of dollars just in heat. Like, that's just structural. But how about the fact that people are going to fly in over this building, and you can make it into a logo. You can do whatever you want. I mean, I just went through four or five, six different, I talked to people in the energy sector, said, what are the benefits am I not thinking about? There's water capture. There were all sorts of brand benefits. There were all sorts of employee benefits for showing that you mean business, that you're going to put up this giant solar array. 
and they came around, you know, but the operational guys at first were like, oh, this doesn't make sense. This, you know, the, the payback's 20 years. They were just saying stuff that made no sense whatsoever given the economics of renewables because most people still have really dated views of this thing. But I think the critical thing was to just think about all the different benefits that make for a larger return on the investment. And that, so this was like, to me, a very close, like a near miss, you know, a very close failure that I see all the time in business. And I think the sustainability investments, even if they're close, still face this incredible burden, um, always do, to have to prove to the, you know, tenths or thousandths place in pennies that just in cash it's gonna equal the expense. And I see the people I know working in sustainability in companies like Tom nodding vigorously that this is what they face in companies. So I just encourage us to do as much as we can to broaden um, the CFO view and the CEO view. You say time, I've got 15 seconds left, according to my, uh, to broaden the view of what this means. All right, I'll end there, thank you. Did I speak fast enough for everybody? Was that? Total New Yorker. Yeah. yeah. I'm in New York today. I got to, you know. Uh, questions for questions and answers. Can I bring you to every talk I give? That is a great, that is a, so yes, that's one of my favorite topics that one of the things I suggest in my book, The Big Pivot, available at bookstores everywhere, uh, $18 or whatever, uh, is that one of the ways around this is to recognize that even if you can't put exact numbers on it, and you're next gonna hear from my friend Daniel Aronson who does some of the best work on putting numbers on things, and we're getting much better at that. But even if you can't, we currently value the things we don't measure at zero, and that's silly. So one way is just to change the rules. And so not as many companies do this as you'd think. I think plenty do things like um, bundling, right? They'll say, if we've got a bunch of buildings, we're gonna do some lighting retrofits, or we're gonna do some retrofits that maybe cost a little more. This one is a half year payback, but maybe this one's three. They put it into one bundle, right? That's one great tool that I've seen for years. And a lot of companies do that, but a few will just change the hurdle rates, they'll change the capex, they'll say two years is silly for this kind of investment. So Intel will say for um, an energy project, I think it's four years, for a building investment that creates some benefit, it's seven years. Because they're building these fabs to make the next few generations of chips. Buildings last decades. I don't see what's wrong with a seven year payback on a building, and frankly, the same with uh, renewables for, you know, if companies aren't doing the PPA model and they're just buying renewables, even if it were three or four year payback, which was a few years ago, so what? You got decades, potentially, of zero cost energy. So I think that's one of the best tools, is just change the hurdle rate. But it is such an anathema to most CFOs, right? There, I recently was in a meeting where a CFO said the only metric that matters is total shareholder return. And this was in a sustainability meeting, all right? This was, I'm not kidding. And that's all you hear, it's the only metric. Not one, but the only. I think that's insane. Um, so I think you have to get in their heads and say like, what if we change this, this metric in some way to allow for these investments? Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Good luck. And, and thanks for the mention, Andrew. What I'm gonna do is, I, I once, a few years ago, I was at a, I was presenting a model very much like this at a, at a conference on metrics for sustainability. And somebody came up to me after and said, wow, of the whole conference, that was the very best presentation. And I said, that's great. And then I made a critical mistake. I said, what did you like about it? And they said, you were the only one that used Excel. <laughs> and this was at a metrics conference, right? <laughs> so I do have slides, but we're not gonna spend much time on them. If you think they're really pretty, tell me later. <laughs> but what I wanna talk about is valuing what I call the core sustainability benefits. What is the situation today is my company valued this. We make tools for sustainability, for setting your carbon targets in two hours instead of two months, for example, or for categorizing your activity across 5,000 dimensions to map them to the SDGs. And those are great. But the things that we really get attention for, that people really care about, is the financial valuation. And the reason is that we as a field, sustainability practitioners, businesses are terrible at this. You've heard that and I won't belabor it, but just as an example, 
we have a list of about 1,000 of the top sustainability influencers in the world that we've compiled for our materiality tool. And we decided to look for those who are corporate, that is not academics, not consultants, to see if their company's website listed them as one of the top leaders of the company, along with the CEO, the CFO, and so on. And on this slide are all the companies for whom that was true. <laughs> Which means that we're fundamentally on the outside looking in. And the reason is because we don't do a good job of showing the money. But what if we could? Right? That's the premise of this event. That's the premise of the Rosie work and so on. And one way that we like to do that at Valuetus, the fundamental sort of core of our approach, is that most of the value of sustainability is submerged. For example, some of the things like employee retention value, we've heard that it's hard to measure, it's so on and so forth. For over a decade and a half, we've had a model that shows that the number is about five times as much as people think. Four times as much is submerged as is actually visible. Now, we won't have time to go through all of these, but there are basically four core aspects of sustainability value. The customer, the operational, the risk, and the employee. And you've heard a little bit about the customer from Andrew, which was great. We did a big study with 20,000 customers, scientific before and after studies and everything. It's great, it's there. Operational, turns out waste reduction is many times more valuable than people think because most of the, the value is submerged. And employee, we, we heard about. But what we're gonna do is talk about risk for a second. So this is, this is not showing up. Okay, this is, Murphy messing with me technologically. Let's see if we can beat back Murphy long enough to show you the model. Okay, there we go. This is a live model on a, you know, a, a real live website that is actually password protected and so on. And this is a model of risk. Now, I'm gonna go through this really quickly for time's sake. There's a lot to it. But you know, here are your basic demographics. You can pick this. You can pick your last year of good data industry and so on, geography. You enter your products, you can choose whether they're in SKUs or product families. If you have done any reach audits of your suppliers, you can put that in here. Obviously, if I have no here, these are NA for the last year it was done. And then products with known issues. Now, then we look at the complexity, the current complexity, right? So there's a worst and a best case assumption for this model because frankly, people really don't know how bad their situation is typically. Right? Your supply chain visibility is, let's say, imperfect, to be nice about it. And it costs some money to go out and get it. To go out and get this information from your suppliers, it takes time and so on. Now, if you actually successfully address the issues, right, which happens, and you can change all these assumptions, right? So I can put this, this happens 85% of the time. And it changes the numbers live. Or I can go back to 75 but in any case, it changes the final number to whatever you put in there. And then there are different ways you can do it for reach and, and so on. You can have the, an exemption. That's one thing you can do, and that has cost. You can redesign the product. If you can't get an exemption, which is not that likely, you have to redesign the product. And there are two different ways you can redesign it. You can redesign it in a major way or in a minor way. And you can see that here, we've been very conservative. That's one thing that we do is we're very conservative with assumptions. We say it's 90% likely to be a minor redesign. That's actually not necessarily true, but if you can make the case with conservative numbers, everything else is graded. And then we have authorizations. So another thing you can sometimes get is an authorization to continue doing what you're doing. And this is also somewhat less likely, and it's basically the catch-all if you don't have to redesign and you don't get an exemption, then there's this. Now, there are a bunch of submerged aspects of each of these. For example, the delay part of redesign is enormous. And just the visibility you get from being a sustainability leader, just the visibility into the fact you're going to have to redesign is typically worth millions of dollars. If your budget for that additional sustainability is less than millions of dollars, 
you've made back your money over 100% instantly on the one submerged delay. Now what we're going to do is look at what happens if you don't successfully address the issues. This is kind of a problem. Uh, this is simply the remainder of the probability of successfully addressing them that we talked about earlier. Of course, you could get fined. You could lose access to the market. And as a result, here are your costs. Now you see in the worst case scenario, your costs are very large. In your best case, they're not nearly as large. These are not the exact numbers that I used with the company because we can't use their exact numbers. But this is the idea. Now what we do is go through this again, except we're going to gray out the numbers on the left a little bit, and we're going to look at what happens if you take comprehensive sustainability action. Right? This is, let's do more than we're doing now. What's the case for that? And you can see that there are, like, there are little pop-ups about what these different things are so that you can explain it, so that people can see it, and so on. The numbers on the left are the same as before, but you can see the numbers on the right. Hey, it costs more to take comprehensive action. And it costs more in the beginning in reaching out. And if you look at exemption-related costs, it also doesn't pay off. If you look at redesign-related costs, well, it can pay off if you, if you add in more delay costs. If you're real conservative with delay cost, not as much. And authorization, no. But here's the interesting thing. And while these are not the real numbers, because I can't do that, these numbers are in the right area, the right orders of magnitude of the difference between the two. You, you start to reduce your fines, of course. Your market loss goes way down because your chance of succeeding in the redesign and everything goes up. And if you look here, between taking comprehensive action on the right and the current level of action, which is also non-zero on the left. Your difference is between, say, $9 million in value, net of all your additional expenses, and $50 million, net of everything. And in case you're wondering, that's an annual number. right? Because this company and every company turns over their SKUs, their products, their designs frequently. So when people say it's hard to measure risk, yes. It's hard to measure sustainability, yes. But it's completely doable, and we need to do it. And we can do it. People will say, is this really possible? And I'll say, well, I don't know. But in 15 years of doing it since the first time somebody said this is impossible, haven't yet run into anything that hasn't been able to be measured, quantified, and valued. And this becomes a catalyst for improvement, right? The larger context of our being here is we need to hurry. If we can tell people, this is worth a lot more than you think, in a lot of ways, we can make a lot more progress a lot faster. <laughs> yeah, the question is, when I take executives through this, and especially, I'll say, especially finance executives, Having just walked through it, they may still say, this is insane. It can't be that high. Is that the case? Spoiler alert, yes. <laughs> and what do you do about it? And basically, there are three things that we do about it. The first thing is say, OK, great. What would you like to change? There are plenty of assumptions. They're all really, really concrete. Right? You can change the likelihood of a major versus minor redesign. You can change how much the delay is and how long it takes. You can change the variability, velocity, or the variety of your product line, the SKUs. What would you like to change? We'll change anything you want. I never argue with them. I never say, this is the right number. What's the point? Tell me what to change, I'll change it. If they're really, really extra conservative, because all the assumptions that go into the model are already conservative, that's part of the design, if they're really extra conservative and really undervalue it, the ROI will drop from, say, 150% to 120%. I'll say, OK, you were right. It's not as much as I said. Do you not want to do it now? Because fundamentally, the framing is not, is this the right number? The framing is, is this the right decision? 
And that is usually clear, regardless of whether it's 0 0.3 cents off or $30 million off or whatever. If you're making 120, 130% a year, the right decision is obvious. Well, so um, really interesting set of speakers doing really interesting research. And I think, you know, we've heard a set of themes that are pretty consistent, which is there's a lot of value being created here, uh, both in our own operations for our customers throughout our value chain that we don't currently capture. It's hard for us to persuade decision makers to capture it, but when we do, there is really valuable information that will improve decision making and also help us scale up sustainability within our companies and within finance. I think one of the things that we also need help on is investors really digging into this and understanding better the financial returns associated with these types of efforts because oftentimes we hear um, from companies, oh, I'm being pressured, I can't make these types of investments because my investors are saying, you know, that's, that's not going to result in the kind of return we want to see, right? So we need um, the CFO uh, function to really focus on this, working together with sustainability. We need investors to be supportive, uh, and we need to use the types of tools that we're all beginning to develop together to really uh, drive better decision making and to scale up sustainability. I think we also need the kind of vision that we heard from Rick at Patagonia where companies say, you know what, this is the right thing to do and in doing the right thing we're actually building a better company and we're building a better world. And the, whole, the, the issues that, that um, Rick talked about around employees, engagement, treatment, I think this is inequities and in how they're treated. This is actually going to be one of the biggest areas for business moving forward along with climate change and environmental issues. So really figuring out how you as a company can tackle that, invest in it, make the argument for investing in it, um, as well as making the argument for innovation like Aston Martin is doing around, um, around their electric vehicles or making the argument for um, marketing and reaching out to people uh, about what you're doing as a way to really uh, build engagement because again, we hear so many times the stories that, oh, all that's going to cost too much or people don't really respond. And let me bring you back to that first study that I showed you where we looked at 80,000 SKUs and everybody said, you know, you hear that sort of the, the myth is that people aren't buying sustainable products and the numbers we need to. It's a niche thing. And yes, at 16%, it's a niche thing. And no, it isn't because 50% of the growth is coming from there, right? And this is recent. So we've got a lot of work to do to take these ideas, um, these numbers, the ro rosy that we're working on together out to the business community, to investors and corporate practitioners. Thank you.